guys here, but I looked up to you all. And uh, Chad and Dustin, I have to admit, this is probably the toughest funeral that I've ever done. Uh, or I've ever preached, and it's an honor to get to do it with you all here today. And it's my promise to you, that every person that I've ever buried in my time in Philadelphia as a deacon, in my time as a priest in Lincoln, a few relatives too, uh, any person that I've ever, ever buried, I add to my right book, and I pray for them and their families every Sunday, the day of our Lord's resurrection, knowing that someday, through the grace of God, through the cross and the resurrection, we will all be reunited again. You know, last night before the uh, funeral vigil, I was talking with Dustin just a little bit, and he said something to the effect that, you know, Justin, that's my name, Justin, did you in your wildest dreams ever think that you would preach the homily at my mother's funeral? Did you ever in your wildest dreams think that you would grow up in Auburn, Nebraska, and somehow become a priest and preach at my mother's funeral? And I thought, boy, that's a good question. Did I ever in my wildest dreams think that I'd be with you and preach at your mother's funeral? I had to stop and think for a little bit. I'm like, Dustin, I don't know if you've ever been in any of my wildest dreams before. <laughs> We've had a lot of wild times growing up in Auburn, and ultimately those times we remember today and we celebrate with joy and thanksgiving to God for what he has given us in our lives and this person today here with us. We're gathered here in St. Joseph's <coughs> Beatrice to celebrate and remember and pray with a person who certainly loved kids and loved family. We're here this morning in Beatrice to celebrate and remember a person who thought and acted only for others. We're here to celebrate, remember, and pray with a person who loved gardening, who used gardens as a lesson in life. We're here this morning to celebrate, remember, and pray with a person who was known to have a head injury a time or two. And we're here to celebrate remember and pray with a person who suffered and persevered and made that suffering make a difference. We're ultimately here this morning to celebrate, remember, and pray with a person named Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ did all of those things, and through the waters of baptism, Connie was attached to the life of Jesus, and Jesus worked through her those same very things I mentioned right now. Thinking of others, gardening, taking a random hit on the head, loving and sacrificing for others, suffering and persevering with grace and dignity. Obviously, we are here to remember Connie, but we're here to remember and praise Jesus for living through her. <coughs> We know that Connie loved kids and family, and we know that she only wanted to be a wife and a mother, and she did that beautifully, raising two children who would become good men in this world who give back to themselves as well, Chad and Dustin. You guys were guys that people in Auburn looked up to, and you received those values from Gail and Connie, and those values live on through you today in your work. And Stone and Cash and Covey and Slayton. By extension, after she was still a mother, she wanted to become a mother again, and she was a grandmother to you all. And you four have a legacy today that you have to make a promise to your grandmother Connie that you will live like she did, sacrificing for others, thinking of others, and sharing her life and her suffering with others. That's your job. You young men become men today. And the world will look to you and your actions and your perseverance. And you can live just like your grandmother. And she will live on through you by God's grace. We know that Connie thought and acted for others. For 27 years she worked in Auburn, Nebraska, making sure we all had electricity. She was a bookkeeper. She knew the town's secrets, but she didn't share gossip. She simply loved people, and that love ultimately comes from Jesus. The heart of selflessness and the 
hard sacrifice and the heart of hard work comes from our Lord, and she exhibited that through her life working at the Board of Public Works. She actually lived about three doors down from me on 16th Street in Auburn, where she worked at the Board of Public Works as a bookkeeper. I lived three doors to the east. And at times in the summer, I would go sell lemonade on the street corner right across the street, and I would go over to the Board of Public Works and offer her a 25 cent lemonade, and I remember her giving me five dollars. And not asking for change, because that's the type of person she was. She gave extra of herself, just like Jesus Christ did. And that's a lesson for each and every one of us to take heart to today. Do we live for the other person extra? Do we go the extra mile? Or do we only live for ourselves? She didn't live just for herself. She lived for others. Jesus in the Gospels loves agriculture. Thank goodness. I think Jesus actually was Nebraskan. He uses mustard seeds and weeds and wheat to share his lessons. And we know that by extension, Connie taught us lessons in the garden that she grew at that home in Little Auburn, Nebraska. And think about the patience and the love that a gardener has to have. When she's raising weeds and rhubarb and corn and cucumbers and peas and beans, think of all the time and the labor that it takes to till that ground. And then as she tills that ground and waters those plants day to day, she thinks of the people that she's going to feed, her family. She thinks of the friends that she's going to feed, her friends. She thinks constantly of the other through the work that she did, just like Jesus did. Of course, we know Jesus suffered with a crown of thorns, and he took a couple of headshots before he got to that cross. Well, Connie, too, took a headshot once. Gail shared a story with me before the softball game that Gail was playing in. There was an errant softball that hit Connie in the head, and it knocked her out cold, and it left a pretty good little bruise there on her head. And if anyone knows Irene Kreitzer, Irene Kreitzer apparently saw this bruise a few days later after Connie had gotten up and said, boy, he must really love Gail if he did that to you. <laughs> Connie suffered in life. She struggled in life. She was dealt bad cards in life. But you would never have known it. In this last year, perhaps she did her finest work. After being dosed with MDS, and suffering with leukemia, she took it for what it was. It was suffering, and she lived day by day with strength and dignity and grace. <coughs> and that reminds us of the cross that we look at today. The beauty of the Christian faith is that we know that death has no sting over us. Cancer has no power over us. In Connie's last months, she was doing her greatest work. Think of the GoFundMe account that brought 106 people together to help her out. Think of all the prayers, the thoughts, and the visits over this last year. To the human eye, we look at the cross and we see a guy bloodied, battered, spat upon, naked, and dead. Yet in that moment of vulnerability is when Jesus did his greatest work. He had to die to open up the gates of heaven for everybody. And it was the same with Connie. In her struggles, bedridden, to the human eye, she's useless. But with the eyes of faith, she was doing her greatest work, bringing us all together from Auburn, from Colorado, from Lincoln, from Kansas City, from Omaha, bringing us all together one last time. She did that from the bed and from the grave, and she is doing her greatest work today. Cancer never took away her dignity, never took away her grace, and never took away her humanity. And in fact, cancer hasn't taken her life. Her life was given to Christ, 
And that life does not end today. It changes. And she, we pray, is in heaven now. Each and every one of us will be greeted with struggles and sorrows. And each and every one of us can look at her and say, Am I handling my struggles with grace and dignity? And when I'm not, look to the cross for that strength and that dignity. And he will help us to get home. Ultimately, at any funeral, I'd like to try to end with some kind of hope. Because that's what the Christian and the Catholic faith is all about, giving hope. One of my favorite scriptures is 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has ready for those who love him. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has in store for those who love him. She loved God. And what must she be experiencing today? I like to try to give an analogy. Suppose maybe you could communicate with a baby inside of the mother's womb, and you could try to describe to that baby that you were not made for that womb. You were made to come out into a world and experience and live it. How would you explain to a baby who's never tasted anything in their life that that little mouth is actually meant to come out in, from the womb into the world and taste chili and sugar cookies that Connie gave us. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has planned for those who love him. What would you say to that baby whose eyes that they can't even open inside of the mother's womb? How would you describe the colors of a Nebraska sunset setting over a Gage County pond? The red and the oranges, the blues and the yellows. How would you describe a trip to the Yellowstone, the sealed faithful? To a baby whose eyes they can't even open. How would you describe that beauty to a baby who can't even talk? Or that hearing? How would you describe to that baby whose hearing only hears the rapid thud of heartbeat? How would you describe that those ears are meant to hear the sounds of a football field in 1993 in Auburn, Nebraska when Auburn runs rampant over the actress? Those crowds roar, and those ears were designed to hear that, and experience that. Or how would you describe to that baby that those hands that they can't even open were actually meant to play the organ and the accordion and give joy to a world that needed joy? Or how would you explain to that baby that that part that rapidly thump, 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 thump isn't made to just thump, 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 thump. But that heart was actually destined to come out into the world and love a man of 49 years. <coughs> Gail Simpson. That heart was made for Gail. That heart was meant to be shared with the world. And that heart was meant to be in heaven. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has ready for those who love him. Friends, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to shed tears, but let's remember what awaits us in a world that we can't even imagine, because our minds are too finite to imagine it. Eternal rest grant unto her award and let perpetual light shine upon her. May the soul of Connie Searcy and all the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace.